When you start getting into virtualization with Proxmox, there are a lot of different changes that you can make which have a huge impact on its functionality. These changes can improve the performance or security for guest VMs and Linux containers, or just improve the management of Proxmox. But the biggest question is always what you should focus on to get the most value. So in this video, we're gonna look at five improvements you can make to Proxmox and the exact value you'll get out of those changes so that you can determine if it is or isn't worth implementing in your environment. Before we get started, I did a video on a few changes you can make to a brand new Proxmox setup, and I'd suggest watching that as this video builds on top of that, but these will be slightly more advanced, so let's jump into it. So the first one is going to be around networking. And that first video that I did that I just referenced, I basically set all of this up. So as you can see here, I have two bond interfaces and that's what that video goes over. But in this video, I wanna talk more about VLANs and how you can kind of secure your Proxmox network one step further. So we're gonna use Bond Zero as an example, but what you can see here is that I'm using LACP on two physical interfaces. Now those interfaces are on a trunk port on my Unify switch. And what that means is that I'm passing through multiple different VLANs to that port. So theoretically, I can create a virtual machine or Linux container using any of these VLANs that you see here. Now to do that, I can go in to a virtual machine, edit the network interface, and I can tag the VLAN directly. But from a security perspective, if you kind of look at this, what you're saying is that the actual VMBR0 bridge is a trunk port. So think of it kind of like a virtual trunk port. You can tag any of the VLANs, but let's say we never wanted a specific virtual machine to ever be able to tag anything else. And Technically, right now, it can't tag anything else, but this kind of takes it one step further. So using that same VLAN tag 220 for that virtual machine, what you'll see here is that I created a Linux VLAN, and it's for the tag 220. So the way that you can do this is you can come in and create a Linux VLAN, and then whatever you specify here as the number, you'll see the VLAN tag is zero. Let's say I wanted to do it for 210. You'll see that VLAN tag changes to 210. Then at that point, you have to pick a raw device. So using the example we said earlier, we're gonna pick the raw device of Bond Zero. So what this says at this point is that this specific Linux VLAN is only going to tag traffic for VLAN ID 210. So in essence, what we're doing is we're gonna use this to create a virtual access port as opposed to a trunk port. So again, before we said it was a trunk port, meaning that it could be used for any of the VLANs that are passed through. Right now, we're only going to allow it to be used for VLAN 210 in this example, but more so it's going to be for VLAN 220. So I created this already and you could see. So how do we then take it to the next step? How do we use it for our virtual machines? Well, we create a new Linux bridge. So then what I did is I went in and I created a new Linux bridge and I selected the bridge ports to be for that Linux VLAN that we created. So it's called VLAN 220, and as you can see, it matches. I just set the comment to be surveillance VLAN. So now what we're saying is that we have a virtual access port rather than a virtual trunk port, and it kind of takes security one step further because now if you wanted to, you could use the Proxmox firewall, which is not part of this video, but you can use the Proxmox firewall to secure this traffic even further. Now, once that bridge is created, you can go inside of one of your virtual machines and in the network interface, you're not gonna tag it anymore. You're just going to use that bridge. And then that will ensure that it's only going to be able to communicate on, in my case, that surveillance VLAN. So the big question is, why would you do this? And the answer is that if you're not really exposing anything externally and you trust all of your virtual machines and containers, this might be overkill for some, but it does provide better separation. So let's say you were exposing one of your virtual machines externally and you had it in a DMZ, using that as an example. This would take that security one step further. It will allow you to use the Proxmox firewall to better isolate them. It will better manage VLAN hopping. Not that it's the biggest concern, but it is a concern if you are exposing this externally. And overall, everything will just be a little cleaner. Now, the last thing I wanna mention is if you're using the same physical interface, so Bond Zero is the physical interface that I have here, 
If you're using this interface, you cannot create a Linux VLAN like I have here and tag the traffic, meaning that inside of the virtual machine itself, where I have 220 here, this will not work. You can only do one. You could either do it this way or you could do it the way I just showed you. So what you'd have to do in order to fix that is you'd have to come in here, you'd have to remove the VLAN tag, then you would have to select the correct bridge. As soon as you do that, everything will work. That's the one caveat to this. But overall, it does technically provide better network segregation on Proxmox itself. Now, the next one is going to be on Proxmox backup server. Now, I did a video on how you can set up Proxmox backup server with an NFS share. I'll leave a pop-up for that now. But overall, what Proxmox backup server does is it does block level backups. So what that means is that you're going to be able to back up a large amount of data while technically using a small amount of storage space. So for example, here, you'll see my UNAS Pro has a deduplication factor of 15.19. What that means is that for every 100 gigabytes I back up, it equates to 1.5 terabytes. So using Proxmox backup server itself is a very powerful way to either store more total backups than you would if you had just a regular NAS using something like NFS or just take up less total storage space. So Proxmox backup server is a great option, but one thing that you can do is you can create sync jobs. So what did I wanna do? I wanted to ensure that because these backups take up such a small amount of space, I wanted to have two copies of them. So I went in, I created a second NFS share for TrueNAS, which is what you'll see here. And then I created a pull job. And what this pull job does is it pulls the data directly from my UNAS Pro. So keep this in mind, I'm running Proxmox backup server. I'm actually running it virtually. Now, in a perfect world, you wouldn't use NFS. You wouldn't run it virtually. You'd have a bare metal Proxmox backup server somewhere with dedicated storage. But in a home lab environment, that's not the most realistic option. So not only is it running virtually, but since I'm using NFS, I was able to connect to two different physical devices. So I have TrueNAS and I have my UNAS Pro. And what I have here is I have a pull job that will run and it will pull the data directly from my UNAS Pro to TrueNAS. Now, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because this can be done to basically automate your offsite backups. So let's say I had a NAS device somewhere offsite that was still accessible through my network using something like a site-to-site -site VPN. I could come in here, add a new data store, configure an NFS share on that NAS itself, and then create a pull job or a push job from one of these, either TrueNAS or my UNAS Pro. And then at that point, I would have three copies of those virtual machines on three different devices, and everything would be automated through this one virtual machine. Now, again, not necessarily a best practice, but for a home lab environment where you're not gonna have a ton of hardware, this I find to be a great way of doing it. Now, the next one is just going to be a regular old Proxmox cluster. So overall, when you get into virtualization, what you're going to do is most likely create one Proxmox node. You'll store all of your virtual machines and Linux containers on there, and overall it will all work and it will work well. But you're probably gonna to get to a point where you have to either add more resources to that server if you can, or you have to expand. And when I say expand, I mean create a second node. Now I say second node because overall, for a true Proxmox cluster, you do need three nodes. However, you can set up a two node Proxmox cluster with a Q device. I did a video on it. That is how I'm running. I can't justify having three nodes because I just don't have enough services right now, but I have more than enough for two. So let's go over a few of the things that a cluster will provide. The first is centralized management. So you can come in here and you can see both of your nodes. You can see all of your virtual machines and Linux containers. You can migrate a virtual machine or container from one to another. You can have centralized backup settings. You can have centralized storage. So overall, I just come in here and I create all of my backup settings for my UNAS Pro, which I still use, but I also do it for Proxmox Backup Server, which is the primary at this point. And then overall, the only thing I exclude is I exclude Proxmox Backup Server so it doesn't back up to itself. But 
My point is that I'm managing this in one location and it applies to all of my nodes. If I come in here and add more nodes in the future, I don't have to go in and recreate my backup jobs. So centralized management is the biggest benefit. But what if you wanted to take it one step further? So the next one is going to be high availability. Now, high availability in essence means that if one of these nodes was to go offline, the virtual machines and containers on the node that is going offline will automatically start up on the node that stays online. So to kind of talk through how that works, inside of your data center, if you go to high availability, you can create high availability rules. So we'll use Home Assistant as an example. So the state is started, and what I'm saying is that the group is PV01 primary. So the group, if we look at PV01 primary, what that means is that PV01 primary has a higher priority for PV01 than PV02. What that means is that if you configure high availability, the primary node that that virtual machine will run on, if you created a group like this, is PVE01 because it has a higher priority. A higher priority in this case means that it has a higher priority. So the highest priority is the primary node that the virtual machine or container will run on. So overall, I have two groups, PVE01 primary and PVE02 primary. Just determines which node I want the virtual machines to run on. So that's how you can use groups. There's also restricted and no failback. So restricted would be restricted if you wanted it to only run on one or two of your nodes if you had more. And no failback means that if the virtual machine migrates from one node to another, when the node comes back online, the virtual machine will not automatically fail back. With this option unchecked, they will automatically fail back. So a virtual machine from PVE01 migrates to PVO2 because it went offline. As soon as PVO1 comes online, it will migrate back. That's the default functionality. If you don't want that, you would have to turn this on. So that's how groups work. But if you go back to the high availability section here, you'll see that I define different groups for some of these virtual machines. And this just allows me to balance from a resource perspective, both of these environments. I don't want most of these virtual machines running on one of the nodes. I want to specify exactly what the primary is, and that's why it's configured this way. Now, for high availability to work, you have to have one of two things. You have to have either shared storage, which would be using something like NFS, iSCSI, or Ceph, and that is true high availability, meaning with shared storage, the virtual machine will automatically kick on, and you won't have any true downtime. What I'm using is ZFS replication. And I'm using that because I'm not currently using shared storage, though I do want to explore it. But with ZFS replication, I replicate these virtual machines from one node to the other. The downside of this is unfortunately, one, obviously you have to be using ZFS, and two, you're basically taking up the total amount of storage space on both nodes. So I have two, two terabyte drives, one in each, if a virtual machine takes 100 gigs and the primary is on PVE01, it will take 100 gigs on PVE02 as well. And then I just specify exactly when I want it to sync. So for example, this is every two hours. So that's how you can utilize ZFS replication. My point is, while shared storage is overall a cleaner and better solution, ZFS replication works as well. And this does provide true high availability just with slightly more downtime, which for me in a home lab environment is completely fine. So the next thing we're going to look at is PCIe pass through. And this can be configured by following these instructions. There's a few steps that you have to do. You basically have to turn IOMMU on in your BIOS. Then you have to go in and turn it on on the Proxmox side. Just follow these instructions. It walks you through the whole process. As soon as you do that, you're able to pass physical PCIe devices to virtual machines. So the biggest one is for GPU pass-through. I did this for like two years. It worked great. But you could do it for a lot of things. So using this VM PFSense here for an example, what I did is I put in a network interface card with, I think, four ports. And I went in, I created a virtual machine for PFSense so that I could create tutorials on it. I then pass through those ports, those physical ports, to this specific virtual machine so I could use one for my WAN port, one for my LAN port. 
So you can virtualize a router if you wanted to. Let's say you were running a NAS device and you had an HBA card. You could pass through that entire HBA card directly to, let's say, a true NAS server. And then at that point, the hard drives that are connected to that HBA card would be visible inside of your true NAS virtual machine. So it's better to do it that way by passing the full PCIe device through to the virtual machine rather than passing through individual disks. So those are three of the biggest use cases. GPU pass-through, passing through physical NICs for either a virtualized router or just to have a physical NIC on a specific virtual machine, and then something like an HBA card to virtualize a NAS. Now, this is something that requires a full tutorial, so I'm not sure if there's any interest in this. If there is, leave a comment. I'm happy to create a tutorial on that. But PCIe pass-through is huge, and you will get a ton of value out of it if you start to use it. Now, I know that not all of these will apply to everybody, and there are some future steps that you have to take to configure all of this. But in the description, I will leave a few videos and written articles I have that will show you how to do just about everything we went over today. And at that point, you can just go through and configure them depending on exactly what you wanna do. Other than that, any comments that you have, any questions, please leave those in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.